Let's look to the Lord. Father in heaven, we are grateful again for the beautiful day you've given us, another day of life, another day of blessings which come from your hand, but another day of opportunity as well, Lord. We pray you would open our eyes, our spiritual eyes, that we might see those who are in need, need of salvation, need of the truth of your holy word. Help us, dear Lord, to come alongside those uh, to whom you have led to us, that we might share this wonderful, life-saving, life-changing message of the gospel of Christ. We're grateful and thankful, Lord, that you sent someone to us that we heard as well. And now we are here, gathered together, brothers and sisters in Christ, praising his name. We thank you, Lord, for all that lies ahead of us today, not knowing what it is, but knowing you, trusting you, having faith in you, Lord, that you have a plan for each of us. You have put each of us on a path, dear Lord, a path that will lead to you one day. And Father, we are grateful for all that will come our way, whether good or bad, Lord. We understand that uh, life is not always a smooth ride. There are many bumps in the road. And so, Lord, we look to you and we uh, just uh, praise your name for whatever lot befalls us, knowing again, Lord, it's been ordained by you and you are with us to never leave us nor forsake us. Greater is he, the Holy Spirit, who is in us than he who is the evil one who is in the world. And so, Lord, we can walk step by step with great confidence, great assurance, great reassurance that you are with us every step of the way. Father, thank you for those who are here today and I was just praying. We know that we're not all here, maybe pain-free or trouble-free. There are issues in life, and we just, Lord, look to you as the author and finisher of our faith to bring us through. Lord, if uh, any that we don't have listed on our bulletin are struggling, you know who they are, Lord, so we, we lift them all up to you at this time. We're blessed to see our sister Elaine with us today, Lord, as she continues to um, get better and give you all the praise, honor, and glory for that. Lord, we are grateful for each and every one who is here today and, and your, your hand upon each of us. Lord, we pray for the nation of Israel. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem, dear Lord. Your word tells us that uh, they will be a great stumbling stone to the nations of the world. And in fact, we know that to be the case just in our lifetime. But it has been going on down through history, the war against your people. They have been reunited in their land since 1948. And now uh, the world is not happy with that. But Lord, we know you're not happy with the world. And we just look to you for, again, guidance. We look to you, dear Lord, as... Again, the one who will bring all of this to an end at some point, but it is in your timing, not in ours. So, Lord, we pray in the meantime. We pray for the Jewish people. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray for the nation of Israel, dear Lord. And as the book that we hold close to our hearts and read daily tells us, that you have not forgotten those people, Lord, and we are grateful and thankful for that. We know you've not forgotten us. And so, Lord, we have a wonderful future, not just in heaven, but here on earth as well. Uh, the road is rocky. The road can be difficult. But death is not the end. It is just the beginning. And for the believer, it is a step into eternity with you. So, Lord, keep us focused on you throughout all that goes on around the world, around the neighborhood, in our own lives, Lord. And just bless us and keep us and encourage us. And we thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Well, again, welcome to everyone who I didn't get to say hello to yet. We do have our luncheon and a short forum afterwards or during the end of the luncheon. So come and join us. It's uh, being catered by Andy Nelson's Barbecue. So most of you should be familiar with that. So come on down and and uh, enjoy 
our time together with, with fellowship and, and celebration. We do have the, uh, the new shoe boxes or the items for the shoe boxes for the month of April downstairs, the green bin when you come in the door, you can see in your announcements, we're collecting washable markers, pens, pencils, erasers, and pencil sharpeners for the month of April. We also have a missions meeting, make note of that missions committee if you would, and anyone is invited to sit in on our missions meeting. It's not a, a formal committee, although we do formally meet every month. Uh, that is next Sunday after church, right up front here, we will have our monthly missions meeting. Um, just a, a quick announcement uh, I made, I think last week, the Christian Youth in Action. If anyone 14 or older is, or if you know anyone who is 14 or older who might be interested in uh, working through the Child Evangelism Fellowship uh, Summer Program, it's a five-day uh, program during the month of July. I always tell people just think VBS. It's, it's similar to that as, and as far as of what we're trying to accomplish, uh, bringing the gospel to children. And if you're 14 and above, you can be trained as a teacher for this five-day club. So keep that in mind. I've got brochures if you'd like one. And finally, for those of you who uh, may have thought the weather was too difficult for us Friday night, about 20 of us braved the elements, and we did have... Um, what would you call it? A, a grill fire. <laughs> we didn't light the bonfire for obvious reasons. We would have burned down about a dozen houses uh, with those embers flying everywhere. But we moved the grill to the edge of the parking lot out there and we fired that up and cooked hot dogs and hamburgers and had a time of fellowship. We sang songs. We uh, had a testimony or two, and it was just a, a good time to be with our brothers and sisters in the Lord. So, uh, and, and even, I was going to say, unless it's pouring down rain, but we even had one during the pouring down rain last year. We just moved it inside. So if we advertise an event, we will have it, and uh, just come and join us if you can. Please stand for our scripture reading which this morning is Acts 2, 23 through 24. Acts chapter 2, beginning with verse 23. Him, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Please be seated. Now, Pastor Dave will bless us with his message, the aftermath of the resurrection. For those who are online, I am a little shorter today. Just came back from Florida and my my tan is doing well. Do you like it? I am, I know the church is blessed to have him, but I got to tell you a secret. I'm more blessed to have him, him in my life. You don't always meet up with the right Christian. I met up with the right Christian and I have been blessed. My family has been blessed. Being called to the ministry means that you're being called to grow in the word and being grow in the things that you do in your life. And it's good to walk the road of sanctification with someone who's continuing to grow. Yes, he knows a lot, but he knows that every day is a new day, a better day to get in touch with the one who brought us here. I'm excited. I invite you. I invite you to take God's infallible word. And turn with me, if you wouldn't mind, to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 1. Acts 
Acts chapter 1. I want to bring a timely message that is directed towards the aftermath of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. Chapter 1 gives us vital background information. The first resurrection sermon follows in chapter 2. And the hearing in chapter 4, before the Sanhedrin, shouts the importance of the aftermath of the resurrection. Before I start, let me breathe a word of prayer and we'll be going. Father God, thank you for allowing us this awesome opportunity every week to come into your house, Lord, and to greet you, praise you, worship with you, to be taught by you, touched by you. Lord, I have absolutely nothing to say except what you told me. Is that not what Jesus said? I only say what the Father tells me. Thank you, Lord, for your children. We are here. And for those who have yet, have yet to accept you as Christ, Lord of their life, we hope this is the day of a new birth for them. In Christ Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Okay, we're going to dig right in. I'm going to start in chapter 1, verse 1. The first account I compose, now this is our brother Luke, the great historian, speaking to a friend, Theopolis. The first account I composed, Theopolis, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after he had, by the Holy Spirit, given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of things concerning the kingdom of God. Gathering them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait. Wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you heard of from me, for John, John the Baptist with water, no, John baptized with water, but you, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit, not many days from now. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom of Israel? <laughs> he said to them, it is not for you to know the time or the epoch which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power. Power from the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and all in Judea and Samaria, and even to the farthest the remote part of the earth. I want to stop right there. Jesus presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs appearing to them. What? For a day? For a week? No. For a period of 40 days, and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. But he didn't stop there. He gave them their marching orders, saying in verse 8, You shall be my witnesses, hallelujah somebody, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. Verse 9. And after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. They also said, men of Galilee. Why do you stand looking into the sky? Two men. Sound familiar? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. Praise God. These men were blessed with the presence of God and, what's more, given a promise. 
a promise that Jesus will come, come in the same way as they had watched him go into heaven. These men, notice, notice, they were not afraid. They were not huddled up together in some corner, locked away behind closed doors. No, those days are over. They are on their way to Jerusalem. Verse 13. When they had entered the city, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. That is Peter and John and James and Andrews and Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus and Simon, the zealot and Judas, the son of James. These all with one mind who were continually doing what? Devoting themselves to prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Got it? Let's move to chapter 2 and pick up the Bible narrative in verse 1 and following. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together, all together, in one place. See the picture. Suddenly, there came from heaven a noise, a, a violent rushing wind, and it filled the entire house and where they were sitting, and there appeared to them tongues, tongues of fire, distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak, speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. How awesome, yes, even amazing, that each person heard the words spoken in their own language. Verse 12, and they all continued in amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, what, what does this mean? But others were mocking and saying, they're full of sweet wine. Wrong focus. And that is why Peter, don't you just love him? Peter steps in. They needed to know that the men were not drunk. Moreover, they needed to know that this was what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. And Peter, right now, people, he's on a roll. Let's drop down to verse 23 and hear what he says. This man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. Folks, I need to repeat, I'm here today to stress the importance of the aftermath of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The central theme of all apostolic preaching is found in the resurrection of Christ from the dead. This was the dominant theme of their preaching. The early disciples had more to say about Christ's resurrection than even his death. It is Christ rising from the grave that proves everything that is necessary and paramount and important about the Christian faith. It is the resurrection of Christ that proves that Jesus Christ is God. It is the resurrection that proves that Christ is the only Savior of the world, not Buddha, not Mohammed, but Jesus, Jesus the Christ. It is the resurrection that proves that his atonement was a perfect sacrifice. That death, that's right, death is not the end of anyone. That there is a future resurrection. That there is a final judgment. And that all scripture, well, is absolutely true. All of this is proven by the resurrection of Christ from the dead. Listen, the greatest proof that Jesus is the Messiah is, is not in his teaching. It's not in the miracles. It's not even in his death, the greatest proof. It rests squarely upon his resurrection from the dead. It is his rising from the dead that stands as the greatest defense 
for our faith, your faith and mine, and the greatest apologetic for Christianity. Thousands of people were crucified upon the Roman crosses in the first century, but only one died, not five, not six, one died for the sins of the people upon that cross, and that one was raised from the dead. Clearly, clearly Jesus of Nazareth is a son of God, and it is demonstrated by what? His resurrection. Without the resurrection, there is no Christian faith. There is no salvation. There's not even any hope. It is hardly surprising then that the first sermon on the day of Pentecost was focused upon the proclamation of the resurrection of Christ from the dead. And Peter, God bless him, Peter continued to preach the resurrection from that day forward to his fellow Jews, to the Gentiles. And whenever Peter stood up to preach, listen, the cross was simply the, the launching point for him to share and proclaim. This one, this one whom you put to death, God has raised him from the grave. And not just Peter, Paul also preached the resurrection continuously. For example, when he was up at Antioch, when he stood before the authorities, it was the resurrection that he stressed and placed before them. Wherever the apostles went, they were preaching the resurrection. And it was a resurrection that underscored the gospel truth. It forged this saving message. It was the resurrection that emboldened these early believers and propelled them out into the world. Listen, if Jesus Christ was not raised from the dead, then absolutely nothing matters. But if Christ is raised from the dead, nothing else matters. So let us be encouraged. Our soul set afire from these passages that we will look at today concerning the aftermath of the resurrection of Christ. Now, what I want to do now is to look at the apostolic sermon in chapter 2, in chapter 2, and then close with Peter's preaching before the Sanhedrin in chapter 4. So let me get started. Acts chapter 2, beginning where? Verse 23. Before I read these verses again, I want to set the stage for you, if you don't mind. On the day of Pentecost, visualize this if you can, when Peter stood up to preach, the first message, it was a resurrection that was front and center in his preaching. There's only one verse devoted to the crucifixion. There were nine verses devoted to the resurrection. It doesn't diminish the importance of the crucifixion, but what it says is this. It is a resurrection that endorses and confirms the power of the cross. One verse on the cross. Verse 23, 9, on the resurrection, verses 24 through 32. This was a shout that was heard on the day of Pentecost. Follow along, please, as I read. This man, now he's referring to Christ. This man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. Okay, what we learn from this, what we learn from this verse is that the cross was no aftermath. It was no reaction on God's part, but in eternity past, excuse me, before the foundation of the world, before time began, this was the very center of the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. Jesus was the Lamb of God slain, that's right, from before the foundation of the world. Those words were no more said than Peter immediately, come on Peter, began to share this second truth on the resurrection. The resurrection is the underscore, the underscore of the cross. So in verse 24, we see how Peter continued to preach, but God. I love this man. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death. 
If the cross was the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, so was the resurrection. The resurrection was no willy-nilly last-minute project on God's part. No way, buddy. The resurrection was eternally decreed by a sovereign God before he created anything or before anything came to pass. All of this, including the empty tomb, was predestined by God before time began. And then in verse 25, he shows us that this truth was recorded in the Old Testament. That's right, the Old Testament, that this was prophesied from of old. This is God's original plan. This is plan A, and let me be clear, there was no plan B. God has always intended the resurrection of Christ from the dead. That's why we say it's primary on the day of Pentecost. And so we read in verse 25, David says of him, okay, Peter now quotes Psalm 16. Come on, Peter. David's prophecy of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, the next time someone tells you, well, <laughs> the resurrection of Christ was not taught in the Old Testament, you send, no, don't send them. You take them to Psalm 16 and read for them. Have them read verses 8 through 11. Let's go deeper. Psalm 16. Dave is looking beyond himself, beyond. He is thinking of a greater descendant of his, a greater son of David. Verse 25. For David says of him, him meaning Jesus Christ. For David says of him, I saw the Lord always in my presence, for he is at my right hand so that I will not be shaken. Verse 26, therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue exalted. Moreover, my flesh also will live in hope. Got to stop right there. These are the meditations of Christ as he approached the cross. He knew that on the other side of the cross, there would be the joy, oh my God, the joy that would be set before him because of the resurrection. But on this side of the cross, with death before him, he kept his focus upon the Father and trusted in the will of the Father. If I may, if I may be so bold to say, you too, in time of trouble, will do well to keep your focus upon the Father and not the problem. We sing a song here, turn your eyes upon Jesus, not the problem. Verse 27, this is the son, Jesus speaking to the father, because you will not abandon my soul to Hades, Hades, that is the realm of the dead, nor allow your holy one, Jesus was the sinless savior, the lamb without spot or wrinkle. He goes on, nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay, meaning he would be killed, yes. He would be put in the grave, yes again, but, <laughs> but he would not remain there long enough for the process of decay to set in, clearly, implying that there would be a resurrection before, before the decaying process would even start nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. Verse 28, you have made known to me the ways of life. That looks to the other side of the cross. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. After Christ was raised from the dead, he would ascend to the right hand of God the Father, and there would be fullness and gladness in the heart of the Savior. Why? Why? Because his mission was fully accomplished here upon the earth. He had completed what he had come to do, to lay down his life as a sacrifice for many. Brothers, sisters, if I may, I pray that you too one day will be able to say, I have completed the work you have sent me to do. Now, 
Look at verse 29. Peter continues to preach. He does not leave the subject of the resurrection. He's like a carpenter. He's nailing it in. He's nailing it in the minds of these people and in their hearts. He says, brethren, referring to the Jewish brothers that gathered there to celebrate Pentecost. Verse 29. Brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Okay, that's a very important verse. Why? Telling us what David wrote in Psalm 16 did not refer to himself because his body was put into a grave, and David's body did suffer decay. So Psalm 16 cannot refer to David. David's bones, they're still with us. They're still in the grave. Verse 30, and so because he meaning David, was a prophet. Yes, he was a prophet, and that means he was looking to the future, the future beyond his day, and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath, with an oath, to see one of his descendants on the throne. Now, this is a reference to 2 Samuel chapter 7, chapter 7, verses 8 through 17. What do we call it? The Davidic covenant, the promise that God made that there would be, from the lineage of David, a greater son, a greater son of David, who would sit upon the throne of David and who will rule and reign. But there's more. Unlike other descendants, this descendant, once inaugurated into office, would rule and reign forever. And not merely over Judah, but over the entire world. Verse 31, he, again referring to David, looked ahead, meaning the future, and spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. Peter is bold about this as he preaches the word of God that the Old Testament is looking ahead to the coming of what? Of Christ, and even the resurrection of Christ. It's all a part of that predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. Now, verse 32. This Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. Can you see Peter in front of them right now? He's letting it all hang out. It's all or nothing. The entirety of his message is resting upon this one truth. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead on this day of Pentecost, the preaching of the resurrection of Christ was primary. And because of this truth, Peter has become bold as a lion. He's not hiding anymore. He's not denying the Christ. He's bold. He is bold. He is bold. Let's move on to our second point. For that, please turn to chapter 4 for me. Please turn to chapter 4 in your Bibles. Verse 5. And I want you to see this important point regarding the resurrection of Christ as it was preached in the Sanhedrin. Very important. Just a little background. The preaching of the gospel by Peter and John was provocative, stirring. It shook up Jerusalem. Jerusalem was turned upside down on its head, so much so they came, the authorities came and apprehended Peter and John, and they brought them before the Sanhedrin to tell them to stop, to stop preaching. This message of a resurrected Christ, I want to say that when people begin to testify and witness to the resurrection of Christ, it shakes things up. If you, on the other hand, talk about a mere historical figure, just talk about someone who lived 2,000 years ago, people just kind of pat you on the shoulder, say that's nice. But when you talk about a risen Christ who comes out of the grave and makes demands upon people's lives, who stands before all, 
that stirs things up. And that's what it did for Peter and John. Let's pick up the reading in chapter 4, verse 5. It reads, on the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes were gathered in Jerusalem. Let's be clear. These were the power brokers. This is the Sanhedrin, the supreme religious body. These are the 70 Jewish leaders who form, got it, the supreme court and senate of their day. And then in verse 6, it speaks to the Sanhedrin leadership. Ananias, the high priest was there, Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were high priestly descent. When they had placed them, that would be Peter and John, placed them in the center, they began to inquire, by what power, what name have you done this? The you refers to Peter and John. Now, why place them in the center? I ask you, why are 70 men surrounding these two men? If I were to walk halfway up to the back and all of you stood and surrounded me, you would get an idea for what it felt like on that day. If I stood there in the center and you all surrounded me, you would get an idea of what Peter and John faced that day. They were there because the Jewish leadership's idea, that was their idea of intimidation. Seventy men, putting them in the center so they would be surrounded by all these imposing figures from the world of religion. They began to inquire, by what power or by what name have they done this? Referring to the healing of a 40-year-old lame man, lame from birth. Verse 8 through 11. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, watch out, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if you, if we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man as to how this man has been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel by the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene whom you crucified, he won't let him forget, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. By this name, this man stands here before you in good health. He is a stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. I love this. Give me preachers like this. Give me Christians who can witness like this. People who respond with boldness. Peter says, are you asking me? In what name was this man healed? Are you asking me about Jesus? Because if you are, I want to give you an answer that everyone will understand. That by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazarene, whom you crucified, He's not backing down. They've asked the wrong man the wrong question. Peter makes it plain. You put him to death, but God raised him from the dead. By the name of Jesus, this man stands before you in good health. Wait, wait for it. There's more. And let's not forget, they discarded him, meaning Jesus. They cast him aside as if he was nothing. But God, he went over to the pile, and he picked up the stone, and he brought it in and made it the chief cornerstone. As quiet as it's kept, God reached in some rubble, and he lifted each of you out as well. God will build his entire kingdom on this risen Christ. Jesus is nothing in their sight. But he's everything to God. Let's go to verse 12. And there is salvation and no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. 
Peter launches into his response. He is on trial in front of the whole Sanhedrin, surrounded by these 70 men. He's supposed to be on defense, yet he turns everything upside down on its head. And he goes on offense and places them in the defense. One man against 70, and it's not a fair fight. While we are here in verse 12, let me underscore, please, that there is salvation in no one else. No one else has gone to the cross and borne our sins. No one else has suffered in our place the wrath of God. No one else has taken down, was taken down and buried. Not one. He has been raised from the dead for our justification. For there is no other name on the earth that has been given by which we must be saved. All of the doctrines of salvation are upheld by this chief cornerstone, the resurrection of Christ from the dead. Every pillar of saving grace rests upon the firm foundation of this resurrection of Christ from the dead. Everything is dependent upon the empty tomb. Brothers and sisters, what have we seen today? We have seen that the resurrection of Jesus Christ was primary. We witnessed the, 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 the impact that the resurrection had when preached in the Sanhedrin. But all of this, all that we have said will mean nothing if the resurrection is not uppermost, prominent, central in your life. Jesus died that you might live again so that you would have the assurance that one day you will rise, be caught up in the air, and join him. Now, if you're saved, brother, sister, please continue in your well-doing. Be faithful in your sanctifying walk with the Lord. Live a life that says Christ has risen. Live that life. If you do not know Jesus, well, this is your time. This is a good time to surrender the reins of your life. Don't wait. Don't wait. I'm calling on you to give up the dirt in your life. Give it up for diamonds. Failure, give it up for victory. Death, give it up for everlasting life. And sorrow, you can drop that as well. Switch it out for joy. God has a place for you. The amazing part is when you look up, you will see he's been looking down. And as you stretch out your hand, he will meet you. Let us pray. Father, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, thank you for all that you do. When we're lost, you find us. When we can't move, you give us strength, Lord. The air that we breathe, nothing is impossible with you. I wasn't there at Pentecost, but I'm, I was there when you saved me. And I thank you. We each of us thank you. And for those that don't know you yet, if you want your tomorrows to be better, than your yesterdays. Reach up. He's ready. He's ready. He's ready. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.